Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Early Life Nutrition and Impact of Later Health. As I already mentioned, I thank you very much for taking time out and being here today. Uh, in case you have not seen this note, which you can find in the internet and you have not made notes for your family, there is one example of well, how this note may look. As you have already heard, I'm, uh, my name is Hania Szajewska. I'm the chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Medical University of Warsaw, Poland. Um, this is my hospital. This is how we usually look nowadays. I collaborate a lot and, and I'm a member of the ESPEGAN. I, I had a number of functions within ESPEGAN, European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. And recently I served as an editor-in-chief for JPGN Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. And I am also, very recently I joined International Scientific Association for Probiotics and, and Prebiotics. As you all know, these are very unprecedented times uncertain and unprecedented. Only four months ago, no one knew that something like SARS-CoV-2 existed. And now the virus has spread to almost every country, to your countries, to my country. Everything is changing, the way we behave is changing. This picture comes from my department, it was today, because we just received, there were every now and there, there were some problems in many countries with, with um, uh, with facial masks, with shields, but we just received, so we are making some pictures to send, to send thank you now to our, to our sponsors. In every country, we are trying to make some jokes of this situation, which happens, which otherwise it's a very serious situation of the social di distancing. I like this one, I need to practice social distancing from the refrigerator. I think it's very much true for many, for many of us. But it's also true and that is a very serious situation. And when you face difficult times, know that challenges are not sent to destroy you. They are sent to promote, increase, and strengthen you. And we all hope that this is what will come from this difficult situation. And in these unprecedented times, don't forget that microbes other than SARS-CoV-2 exist. Please don't forget that people with conditions other than COVID-19 do exist. Currently, we see infants who are born into a society affected by SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Uh, one can call it Generation C, with the consequences that hopefully will not be any harmful, but of course, we don't know as yet. And don't forget that early life has an impact on later outcomes. And this is exactly what will be covered in my presentation today. Early life nutrition and impact of later health, on, uh, on later health. There are three topics to be covered in this presentation, which I would like to cover. First, we are what our mothers, our parents eat. We are what we eat. So I will talk about nutritional and microbial programming. Basic and observational research matters. I will talk about ep epigenetics as one of the mechanisms for how early nutrition programs long-term health. Clinical evidence matters. And I will talk about effects of interventions in early life on later outcomes. I will show you three pictures asking the same question. Is there a link? Is there a link between what happens, what the mother eats during pregnancy, and the risk of obesity and risk of allergy in her, in her child. Is there a link between the choice of feeding of an infant early in life, breastfeeding versus formula feeding, and the diseases which I mentioned, diabetes, coronary heart disease in addition. Is there a link between the birth weight and the coronary heart disease 40, 60 years later? And I presume the answer is yes, because the concept of early nutritional or metabolic programming is quite well known, which means that nutrition and lifestyle during pregnancy and infancy can affect a range of different bodily functions, and those program changes in the body increase the likelihood of some diseases in later life. And this early metabolic programming of long-term health and disease has another also in term developmental origins of adult health and disease, or DOHAT, it's called DOHAT hypothesis. 
but it's not only nutritional programming which is important, also early microbial programming is important. And you know that the factors, there are a number of factors which are influencing neonatal colonization, such as duration of gestation, it's better to be born at on terms and preterm, mode of feeding, breastfeeding versus formula feeding, also when it comes to microbial programming, not only nutritional program, programming. Mode of delivery, vaginal versus cesarean section. I don't know how it is in your country, but in many countries, the rates of cesarean sections are extremely high. In Brazil, for example, in private settings, it's more than 80%. And we know there are studies showing association between cesarean section and some out, uh, outcomes such as allergy or obesity. Environment. Here, what is written, it's NICU, Neonative Intensive Care Unit. But environment is also what happens nowadays with COVID, with a lot of question marks, whether it will have some impact on microbial uh, programming. And the use of medications, especially antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors. Antibiotics are definitely one of the biggest achievements in medicine, but they are very much overprescribed. And again, we do have studies, observational studies, showing associations, links between the use of antibiotics and the risk of uh, obesity or allergy and intestinal microbiota plays a role. So if everything goes right, then it results in symbiosis, in immune tolerance, in intestinal homeostasis, in healthy metabolism. But if things go wrong, it results in dysbiosis. And currently, there's really a lot of diseases which are being linked to this, their pathogenesis is being linked to dysbiosis, alteration in the number and function of the, uh, of the microorganisms, mainly in the gut. But then people are asking the question, is programming really possible with this nutritional and microbial pro uh, programming? I really like this quote from Thomas Huxley, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And fact in medicine is nothing more but evidence. And a lot of people are working on evidence. This is one of the projects which looked at early nutrition, what is happening early in life, and there are consequences, mainly on overweight and obesity. It was, it was funded by the European Union. Professor Bert Kolecko from Munich uh, was, was the leader of this project, and our department had a chance to participate in this project. And we were looking, one of the teams, there are many teams, but one of the teams that were looking at the effects of early nutrition on later outcomes. But how it all began, and you are probably aware of the Barker theory. The Barker theory states that the way an infant grows in utero affects its health in adults. And the Barker hypothesis der derived from a historical cohort. And if you look at these maps, one which shows death rates of coronary heart disease in men in May 60, late 60s, uh, 70s, and infant mortality, you will see earlier, you will see a strong correlation between in infant mortality because of intrauterine growth retardation, because of low births when infant, because of premature births and coronary heart disease, also other diseases type 2 diabetes, hypertension, etc., cetera, et cetera, in middle age. So it was like the metabolic programming by fetal undernutrition. The, one of the first studies, if not the first study, of uh, which has documented this. Uh, of note, it's well supported when it comes to higher income countries, but not so supported by evidence from low income countries where there is quite high infant mortality, but this rate as, as of today are still much lower from coronary heart diseases are much lower than in high income countries. But for low in, uh, for, uh, that in high income countries, but for high income countries, definitely this Barker hypothesis seems to be very true. Another study, another observational studies which are important for our discussion are observation during famine, uh, Dutch famine 44-45. There were serious food shortages and the major reduction in daily food intake over a six month period, almost by the end of the Second World War, which had significant impact on the offspring of women who were pregnant at that time. 
And if you look at those evidence, uh, at the at those studies, you will see that people who were conceived during the femur had high risk of obesity, higher rate of coronary heart disease, almost twice as, as high, higher risk of type 2 diabetes, also other diseases, higher risk of schizophrenia, higher risk of depression, uh, depression, uh, atherogenic plasma lipid profile, response to stress, so a number of these um, of, of, of conditions, among them there were non-communicable diseases which are of such interest currently. And the, the touch feminine, uh, the, the, the study show the timing is important, that early gestation appeared to be most the most vulnerable period. So timing and most of these har uh, 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 harmful effects was observed when uh, early uh, during pregnancy. Um, it's not only undernutrition which is important, also overnutrition is undesired. And here is a summary of the data. Maternal gestational diabetes, which is often associated with high birth weight, maternal overweight and excess pregnancy weight gain, all results in higher rates of obesity, higher rates of type 2 diabetes in later life. Fetus of a mother with uh, uh, gestational diabetes is exposed to increased concentration of glucose, lipids, amino uh, uh, acids, which are crossing placenta. They cause hyperstimulation of the fetal pancreas, hyperinsulinemia, and uh, eventually uh, contribute to fetal overgrowth. So fetal overnutrition is also undesired. Also, postnatal weight gain makes a difference. And again, we do have some studies showing the greater childhood and also adult weight and BMI con are consist is cons consistently associated in cohort studies with increased risk of adult adiposity, increased risk of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. One of the studies, already quite old study, but important showing that rapid infant growth was associated with increased obesity risk, greater insulin resistance, greater risk of cardiovascular disease, 20% of the risk of overweight explained by high infant weight gain from zero to four months. And one of the conclusions of this study was that the pattern of rapid weight gain during the first four months of life was associated with an increased risk of overweight status at age seven years, independent of birth weight and weight attained at age one of one year. So postnatal um, growth really matters. And you are probably aware of the famous saying, grow now, pay later. Pay later with the diseases. So overall, both under and over nutrition, as well as postnatal weight gain can program later outcome. Program outcomes may not appear late until late in life, like coronary heart disease, hypertension, or type, 1, type 2 diabetes. However, it's important to stress that evidence comes from observational studies. So observational studies always shows only associations. And associations, it's not the same as causation. And this kind of other studies is needed, but not always feasible. Why all of this is so important? It is important because the epidemic of Western, so-called Western diseases is rising. Coronary heart disease, six million people in the US die each, in, each year. I'm coming from Poland. It's one of the main reasons that people are dying. In three countries, country, it's probably the same. Type two diabetes worldwide, 250 million people uh, has, uh, have type two diabetes. Overweight and obesity, the fifth leading cause for global deaths. And last but not least, food allergy depends on the country, depends on the region, but affects approximately one in 20 children and one in 50 adults. So it is important. So my summary number one for this part of my presentation is, we are what our mothers, our parents eat. We are what we eat. Early life nutrition, which refers to nutritional, refers to nutritional exposures, prior to conceptions and during pregnancy, infancy, and early childhood. And these exposures can leave an, imp uh, an imprint on the fetus and young child that results in increased risk for disease in later life. But then the question is, what are the mechanisms behind it? How it is possible that the organism remembers 50, 60 late years later what happened early in life? 
And of course, there are many theories about that, but one which really is um, in the center of attention is epigenetics. Epigenetics could be one of the central mechanisms for how uh, early nutrition programs long-term health. What is epigenetics? If you look at the, at the, at the, at the um, literature, you will see many definitions. One of them defines epigenetics as biochemical modifications of the DNA in a stable, habitable manner without changing the underlying DNA sequence. DNA is the same, but still the expression of the genes will be different. There are a number of epigenetic, epigenetic mechanisms, but those which are really call most of the attention are, uh, include histone modification and especially DNA methylation. And DNA, DNA methylation is important in the context of what we are discussing today because, because nutrients from food are funneled into a biochemical pathway that extracts, so here is the food, extracts metal groups which are then attached to, uh, to DNA. And to simplify that, that genes, it's like the genes as a consequence will be switched off or on and will be switched off when methylated. So here we have gene switched on transcription. However, if DNA methylation uh, occurs, so this epigenetic phenomenon, then uh, genes are switched off. There's no transcription. And now I would like to show you the animal model. I really like this experiment. I hardly ever in my presentation show animal model, but this is really something which is very convincing. So I hope you will, you will, you will follow me now. So those two mouths are genetically identical, but if, as you can see now, phenotype is completely different. So genetically identical, they do have the gene which is called a Guti gene. And the agouti gene is responsive for this color, this yellow color of the fur, and it's also responsive for, the, for obesity, for diabetes, and for, uh, for cancer. And what differs those two, those two animals is the diet of the, mouse, uh, of the mother during pregnancy. The mother of these mouse was fed normal mouse diet, and as a consequence, a mouse, uh, a Guti's gene was unmethylated. So it results in this yellow fur, obese, prone diabetes, or prone to diabetes. So full expression of the Aguti gene. Here, the mother of this, of, the, of this mouse was fed diet supplemented with choline, folic acid, betaine, and vitamin B12. And as a result, we have a Guti gene which was methylated. So what, what I already showed you, the gene is on or off. The gene was off. And the result is this brown color, low disease risk, no obesity, no diabetes. They are not prone to the cancer. Genetically identical. The only difference was the diet of the mother. It's really example, uh, animal example, which is, seems to me very convincing. But then the question is, can we trust in vitro models? Can we trust animal research? Well, well, please remember that nearly every Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine has relied on basic animal data for the research. So as much as we would like to have human studies, all these basic animal studies, animal data are extremely, are extremely important. Still, we are interested in human studies. And I would like to show you just one of these human data. This comes from uh, Professor Andrew Prentice's team. He's um, work, uh, working in Gambia, and he's doing a lot of experiments, a lot of studies on this, on this early nutritional program. And I will just show you one of them. So this is the area, I think that these pictures were taken by Andrew Prentice. This is the area where he is living in, during the harvest season. And so everything, everything is green, there's plenty of food, etc. etc. And this is a picture taken at the same place during hungry season. And they were looking at birth season and adult mortality. And what has been shown that birth during the annual hungry season versus the annual harvest season resulted in a significantly greater risk of premature adult mortality. This is a harvest season. This is a hungry season, 
and these are the survivors. So you can see it's really a huge difference between those two. So this is one of these observational human studies which are so important for us to understand that early nutrition is really important when it comes to later outcomes. So my summary number two from this part of my presentation is that basic and observational research matters. Studies suggest that epigenetic dysregulation is an important mediator in the development origins of health and disease, so the whole DOHAT concept. And of course, I showed you some of the data, mainly observational data, and further high quality research is needed to better understand the underlying mechanism. As frustrating as it is, further research is needed. And we also need more human and interventional studies. And in the third part of my presentation, I would like to talk about these interventional studies. I really like evidence like many of you. I really like evidence-based medicine. I really like randomized controlled trials. And I really would like to see if there's early interventions do have any impact on later outcome. When it comes from evidence from randomized controlled trials, please remember that RCTs are not always ethical or feasible. Think ethical, not always ethical. Think about breastfeeding versus formula feeding. There is no ethical committee, nowhere in the world, which would agree to uh, randomly assign infants after birth to be breastfed or formula fed. So we will always have some problems with this study design. We will not have real, true randomized control trials. And the other problem, and this was Mary Futre and colleagues who, 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 uh, who addressed it in already a few years ago in the articles published ar in Archives of Disease in Childhood, that with all these nutritional studies, there is one problem which is lost to follow up. Risk of attrition bias uh, lost to follow up, which results, I mean, especially if you have a study with a very long follow up, five years, 10 years, or anything like that. If you are, if you are involved in any, in any of those studies, you will know how difficult it is to keep the population for a year, for two, but for longer is even more difficult. So it results in selection bias, in loss of power. And it's easy to say the study is underpowered, but it's not so easy to, uh, to perform this study. So keep this in mind. I would like now to focus on the effects of intervention in late, uh, early life and later outcomes. And I will briefly talk about the interventions to increase breastfeeding and interventions to prevent later outcomes. First, I would like to talk about the PROBIT study. It's a very well-known study to, uh, to assess the effect car carried out randomized trial in the Republic of Belarus. And it, it was to assess the effects of breastfeeding promotion on breastfeeding duration and exclusivity uh, of, um, and of GI infections and respiratory infections and atopic eczema among infants. So it was not that infants were um, uh, randomly assigned to, to be breastfed or not, or, uh, or not, but it was the regions in the country which there was breastfeeding promotion or no breastfeeding promotion. And if you look at the summary of the results, huge trial, cluster randomized control trials with more than 17 pairs, mother and infant. And the breastfeeding promotion intervention in PROBIT was associated in infancy with reduced risk of gastrointestinal infections and atopic eczema. So there was definitely the effect. And at six to five years, there were some effects on uh, IQ higher verbal IQ, higher performance IQ, higher full-scale IQ. But for a number of other outcomes, this breastfeeding promotion intervention was not associated with the, with the positive outcomes. So there was no effect in, in infancy on respiratory tract infection. And at 6.5 and, uh, years, no effect on asthma, allergy, measures of adiposity, stature, uh, blood, pressure, uh, blood pressure, dental caries, chair behavior, and at 11.5 years, no effect on overweight or obesity or IGF-1 levels. So there were some effects, some positive, but not for all outcomes, but still an important study showing that breastfeeding promotion, at least for some outcome, is beneficial. I already mentioned that I was part of this early nutrition program. 
project, which was funded by the European Union once again, led by Professor Bert Koletsko from Munich. And we were looking at the effects of early nutrition on the risk of uh, obesity on various outcomes, uh, but especially on the risk of overweight and obesity. And this is one of our systematic review, which we, which we published with, which we performed within this early nutrition project. We look at various nutritional intervention or exposure in infants and children aged up to three years and their effects on subsequent risk of overweight, obesity, and body fat. And this, what I'm showing you now, is a systematic review of systematic reviews. And if you look at the breastfeeding, there was a consistent association of breastfeeding with a modest reduction in the risk of later overweight and obesity. The odds decreased by 13% based on high quality studies. However, residual confounding cannot be excluded. These were never randomized control trials. Uh, another intervention which we looked at, which was lowering protein content, which was promising. For complementary feedings, there were no consistent evidence of any of the association of any intervention and the effect of overweight and obesity. One of these interventions which is very often discussed is lowering protein content. And we look again in more details on these interventions. So we look at the, we, knew, we know that protein intake may influence important health outcomes in later life. So our objective for this systematic review was to investigate current evidence on the effects of formula, formulas with different protein concentrations on growth, body composition, and later risk of overweight and obesity. And we found, we identified 12 randomized control trials, and perhaps the strongest evidence comes from the European Childhood Obesity Project, a CHOP study. And these data from this large randomized control trial showed the consumption of um, lower protein formula. This is what you can see here results in weight for length, which is similar to breast with infants and significantly lower than what you can see in infants fed high protein formula. And this is exactly for BMA again, again here. This is, uh, uh, these are breastfed infants and this is a lower protein formula. And also those children will follow up to six years and you can see again the difference between breastfed infants and uh, low protein formula and, uh, group and higher risk of obesity in children up to six years uh, in high protein, uh, um, high protein group formula, formula, uh, formula group. You can ask, of course, what is the mechanism behind this? And the early protein hypothesis is that increased protein supply results in increase in the concentration of insulin releasing amino acids such as branch chain amino acid leucine isolate leucine valine it results in increased concentrations of insulin and insulin like growth factor one and consequently in increased weight gain and increased adipogenic uh, activity this was also part of the of the chop the chop study uh, published by the same same team as for every study, there were some strengths and limitations of the data. The strengths of this data is that it's a randomized, a randomized control trial with large sample size, multinational design. There are five countries, including Poland, taking part in this with a long follow-up period. Anthropometric measurements were well standardized, extremely important, and major potential confoundings were considered. However, as always, there were some limitations which is one of the, the, those limitations is that there's limited generalizability. Study formulas are not available anymore. As a matter of fact, this is an issue which applies to many other studies when we are uh, evaluating infant formulas, that every now and then those formulas are later on not existing, not on the market. Completely new formulas or very, very uh, different formulas are available. And high attrition, I already co commented on that, that the high attrition loss to follow up is one of the major problems in studies with a long follow up. And even if dropout rates and reason were similar in both groups. So, of course, this is an important uh, for uh, interpretation, but still high in attrition, high loss to follow up uh, is an issue in this kind of the studies.
So I have discussed one of these um, uh, effects of various intervention on obesity and uh, overweight and obesity. Now let me move to another topic, which is uh, food allergy or allergic diseases. And let me talk a little bit about potentially allergenic foods and whether there are any interventions to reduce the risk of allergy. And let me start with milk. What is new? This is a study which was published by the end of the last year in JAMA Pediatrics, important study about this so-called dangerous bottle. There is always, of course, we do promote breastfeeding, but every now and then there is a necessity or just a wish to give some, some milk formula. And this was a randomized control trial involving 300, or more than 300 newborns. And it shows that the risk of sensitizations to cow's milk and immediate type food allergy, including cow's milk allergy and anaphylaxis, were decreased by avoiding supplementation with cow's milk formula for at least the first three days of life. And data are not very consistent from the literature. There are data showing and that early, um, early introduction is not so harmful, but also those which are showing that there is negative effect. Uh, so all of this should be taken into account. But I think that many of us now um, agree that one should consider not supplementing with cow's milk in the first weeks of life to prevent food allergy, regardless of the risk of food, food, food allergy. Um, now let me move to other potentially allergenic foods uh, with regard to timing of introduction of specific foods. There's a number of randomized control trials available now. They were published. Some of them are still ongoing, on, but many of them have already been published. And there are two important studies. One is a LEAP study and one is the EAT study. And especially the LEAP study is important for all our discussion about the timing of introduction of uh, potentially allergenic foods, or generally speaking, complementary foods into the diet. This was a study um, to evaluate strategies of peanut consumption and avoidance to determine which strategy is more effective in preventing the development of peanut allergy in infants at high risk for the, for the allergy. It was a randomized uh, controlled trial, open trial with intention to treat analysis. Population were children aged four to 11 months. Uh, uh, on average, it was seven months at high risk for allergy. So they had severe eczema, egg allergy, or both. Why there was such a population? because this is a population where there is high risk of peanut allergy. And the whole study was about avoiding reducing the risk of peanut allergy. Intervention, so those in, uh, children, infants were randomly assigned to the intervention group with peanut consumption, at least six, gram, six grams of peanut protein per week until five years of age. And comparison was avoidance of peanuts until five years of age. And the primary outcome was peanut allergy at five, in, uh, five years of age. And um, the, here are the results in skin brick um, test negative cohorts, skin brick test a positive cohorts. In both cohorts, I will just show you some of uh, the major, the most important results. And as you can see, there was a relative risk reduction in SPT negative cohort, almost 87%, SPT positive 67%. But if you look at the effect size, it's really a huge effect size, which I would say was quite simple intervention, early introduction of peanuts, of course, in the form in the, which is acceptable, acceptable by infant and young children. And, and this study, which shows that early introduction of peanuts and consumption for five years really reduces the, the risk of peanut allergy, I think that uh, you all agree that this um, is, is one of the most important uh, studies uh, when it comes to, to, to infant nutrition or the introduction of complementary food. And this landmark study resulted in definitive changes in infant, in infant nutrition. But there are questions, as always. For example, how relevant is early peanut introduction in countries with low peanut allergy prevalence? I don't know how it is in your country, but I can tell you, in my country, the uh, peanut allergy is not still very prevalent. So this is an important question. So these uh, results of the studies are clearly applicable to countries 
where the peanut allergy is a problem. But for other countries, one should, would say, well, we need more research. But we cannot, I mean, this kind of study will be difficult to repeat. So we have to make some conclusions based on the evidence which is available. I will come back to it. Another important study is the EAT study. And here in this study, they look not at high-risk population, but they look at the general population. And they were interested not in one single uh, food, but in a number of, uh, of products. And you can see it here. And I like these pictures to show what was a kind of food and the amount of food which those children had to eat uh, by the age of five months. And I'm sure you agree that there is, it is quite a lot. And if you look at the primary outcome, which was allergy to one or more food, you will see that this early introduction resulted in the reduction in the, uh, in the risk of food allergy. However, the difference was not statistically significant. This was in the intention to treat analysis. But if you look at per protocol analysis, which means only those infants whose parents were able to, to force, I should say, or to, to introduce what the investigators wanted, then if in this pair protocol analysis, you can see the diff reduction and it was statistically significant. But look at the number, out of almost 11, uh, 1,200 participants, only slightly more than 700 infants or the families were able to do what the investigators wanted. So it shows that well, the intervention works, but in real life may be very difficult, may be very difficult to implement. There are many other studies, and of course the next stage is that you perform meta-analysis of all available randomized controlled trials. This is one of such meta-analysis published in JAMA Pediatrics already a few years ago. And here you can see that, for example, early, I did not discuss, but I will show you, early introduction of uh, eggs reduction in the risk of egg allergy, 44%. Early introduction of peanuts, those two studies which I showed you, reduction in the risk of allergy, 71%. And milk, there was no significant difference. I would like to call your attention to egg because there's a lot of discussion about early versus late introduction of eggs. And it's also important what is the form of the eggs, pasteurized raw versus cooked egg. And if you here, look here, you will see that we are talking about uh, pasteurized raw uh, eggs, there was reduction. However, please remember that there were anaphylactic reactions to raw, raw, raw eggs. So if you are interpreting the results, you should outweigh benefits and harms. And harms, anaphylactic reaction, it's really something that we have taken into account. Cooked eggs, hard boiled uh, cooked egg, there is reduction. And uh, however, the study was in infants with eczema, which is much smaller amounts of egg compared to other studies. So as always, when you look at the studies, there are some limitations, there are strengths, but there are also some limitations important for the interpretation. And one more comment that all trials come are from a few high income countries. We do not have any studies on lo from law coming from low income countries. Again, important for interpretation. But I think there's a general agreement nowadays, or at least a discussion goes into the, uh, into the, the, the direction that small quantities of cooked egg from the start of complementary feeding, regardless of the risk of food allergy, may be recommended. I do call your attention cooked egg. So it should not be pasteurized, pasteurized from cooked egg, hard boiled egg, for example. Okay, so I showed you some of these studies on, and it's really programming by complementary feeding, but they are scientifically, scientifically challenging. Of course, randomized control trial is an ideal study design, but difficult. Uh, please remember, we are talking every now and then about nutrient versus diet. We are not giving nutrients, we are usually giving diet. So, so it's a complexity which, which should be taken into account. General accessibility may be limited, it's because of the countries or the settings uh, in which it was performed, high risk population, low risk population, baseline risk for the disease in any, in any given country and risk of attrition bias and loss to follow up. I already commented on it. It's especially important in the studies which, with long follow up, which is so important for us. But then the attrition bias, the loss to follow up may be quite high.
So, timing of introduction of potentially allergenic foods, what to recommend? And they are an ESPEGAN recommendation 2017, so already three years ago. Allergenic foods may be introduced when complementary feeding is commenced at any time after four months. There's no convincing evidence that the avoidance or delayed introduction of allergenic food beyond four to six months reduces allergies. For peanuts, infants at high risk of peanut allergy, those with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both, should have peanut introduced between four and 11 months following evaluation by an appropriately trained specialist. This is especially important in countries where there is a low risk of peanut allergy because there is no reason to, to introduce a peanut to every uh, child. But with those with severe eczema, with egg allergy, it's a different consideration. American Academy of Pediatrics, 2019, so only last year, allergenic foods. There is no evidence that delaying the introduction of allergenic foods, including peanuts, eggs, and fish, beyond four to six months prevents atopic disease. For peanuts, there is no evidence that early introduction of peanuts may prevent peanut allergy. And in countries where peanuts are the part, uh, and it should apply to countries where peanuts are the part of the usual diet. This is what I already told you about these controversies, how much the results of the LEAP study are applicable to, to other countries when the, the um, risk of peanut allergy is different. And finally, I would just call your, we would like to call your attention, the IAC European Academy for Allergy and Clinical Immunology is working on updated guidelines. It will be based on systematic review, which is uh, already, I think, already published or will be published very soon. And the guidelines, I hope, will be before the IAC Digital Congress in London, that it should be, that it should be already available. So my summary number three for this part of my presentation is clinical evidence matters. Early feeding practices could potentially influence later health outcomes by programming effects. And I did show you some of the results. So the three topics, uh, three topics which were covered in this presentation were as follows. We are what our mothers, parents eat. We are what we eat. Uh, and I discussed briefly nutritional and microbial programming, basic and observational research matters, and I discussed epigenetics very briefly as one of the mechanisms for how early nutrition programs long-term health. And lastly, I discussed clinic, uh, I, I commented on clinical evidence, which also matters, and I discussed effects of interventions in early life on later outcomes. But as, as George Bernard Shaw said, science, science never solves a problem without creating 10 more. And it also applied to the topic which I discussed today. There's a number of questions, a number of challenges, and I'm sure you will have some questions in, uh, as well. What is the extent of early life programming? What are the relevant nutritional exposures? Which one of them are really important? What are the critical time periods? Perhaps there are different ones that we are discussing at the moment. What are the underlying mechanisms? I just discussed one of them, epigenetics, because there are a lot of studies. But is there different mechanisms equally important? Is there a unifying concept? Are there differences between deficit and surplus situation? What are the most effective interventions for preventing or reducing adverse, uh, adverse programming effects? There are other challenges, methodological quality of evidence. A lot of evidence, it comes from observational studies, which are showing associations, but they are not proving causation. L a lack of robust diagnostic criteria and an adequate control group in many of the studies. Most of the evidence is from high income countries. So then the question is of applicability to middle or low income countries. How relevant is early peanut introduction in countries with low peanut allergy prevalence? I already commented on, I commented on it. Still, it's difficult to say more studies are needed because we cannot repeat and repeat it again, again, and again. So we have to make our conclusions based on what is available. High risk populations only or populations at the general risk. Many of the studies, there are some exceptions, but many of the studies are in high risk population. But perhaps, but we, we have to know what to do in general, in uh, populations of general risk. Uh, 
how much allergen exposure, how much um, allergen dosage is enough to prevent food allergy, and many, many other questions and challenges. And even if the best evidence is available, it does not automatically lead to improved health outcome. This is a slide which I very often show to our medical students, the one which I showed to our residents, and I also very often show it in various, various meetings. So allow me to show it also, <coughs> also to you. And you can see that there are many barriers between the evidence which may be available and clinical outcome. And these barriers extend from awareness to adherence. And there is a role for physician. Physicians should be aware of the evidence. They have to accept the evidence. Evidence should be applicable. Physicians should be able and act on the evidence. But there is also the role for patients. Patients have to agree on the evidence. And last but not least, they have to adhere to the evidence. So again, even if the best evidence is available, it does not automatically lead to improved health outcomes. And let me finish my presentation with a final slide. And my final slide is, make sure you have finished speaking before your audience has finished listening. I did my best. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I start with coronavirus, I think. What about the psychological impact of this pandemic on our kids? How can we help them to overreact to this stress? Well, I did mention these infants who are born or children, infants who are born and children who are already. And I think, uh, as I already mentioned, it's a disease we did not know anything about it. We did not, it exists four months ago. All of us are learning from experience from others. I don't know how it's in your country. In our country, there are not so many in children or infants who are already um, infected with, with coronavirus. Very few, I should say. Of course, there is a lot of psychological uh, issues. I, I think it should be a different webinar with psychologists, how we can deal. But I think it's really important, important question for which the question I do not have the, the answer, definitely not a short answer. But thank you very much for raising it. I really, I really think it's an important. Uh, I want to know what are special dietary interventions for ch children in COVID-19. I'm not aware of any, of any special dietary interventions. I, I know that people are interested in various aspects. I don't think that diet was one of them, and I'm definitely not aware of, of any special recommendations, but I think we will, we will learn more and more, or every day we hear something. I want to know the exact dose of formula milk for baby below one year uh, of age per day. Ha, huh, that's a good question that you want me to ask, that you ask me one below one year of age. I can tell you how I teach the students when I, they ask me what is the amount, the volume, uh, and how to remember. I don't know whether I will answer your question, but it's always the months in the middle. So if there is a four months old child infant, it's 140 milliliters. If it's five months, it's 150 uh, milliliters. And then you have to check, I mean, what is the age and uh, whether it's only infant formula or other foods that you should receive. But for me and for our students, it's a way how I would teach them to remember on average, because of course it might be slightly more or slightly, uh, slightly uh, less. I, I hope I did answer the question. Uh, can you ask the assign, you can ask the assigned, ah, there was an answer already, <laughs> that's a nice, you helped me. Uh, I want to Dr. Anas for this kind of invitation and for this fruitful presentation. Thanks a lot. At what age we start four months, whole egg or yolk? Well, for, there is still the discussion, definitely not before the age of four uh, months. Uh, as you know, the Espegan as you may know, the Espegan recommendations, you start any kind of, you may start any kind of complementary feeding uh, at the beginning of the fifth month. Doesn't mean that you have to do. And definitely, definitely it has to be cooked egg, not pasteurized, not raw egg. And yes, there is no problem. I mean, if it's a cooked egg, it could be both 
egg, uh, um, yolk and, and, and white part. So this, this is okay. You will uh, hear, you will read more details when the ERQ guidelines are published. Again, I hope it will be before the ERQ London meeting in London. We are finalizing the document. Okay. Um, We know that immune tolerance is one of our targets uh, target during early nutrition programming and during the coming years it will be the main objective with the current situation of COVID-19 from your point of view is the developing the infant immunity is based uh, only one human milk component or its multi components. Uh, I think definitely immunity is a multi multi component issue and many many interventions or many things that we are doing in the in in for infants can contribute to immunity and definitely breastfeeding is something that we have to promote I, 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 we don't have any data for COVID as yet but it's absolutely clear to me and and there is I can tell you I'm part of the ISAP as I already mentioned and only yesterday we had a, a conference call and we were discussing whether or not we have any data when it comes to, um, to uh, for example, probiotics and viral infections. So we are trying now to, 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 to explore that, but the answer is, for example, for that, no, there is no any data for COVID, for, 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 um, for, for, for the coronavirus that we have at the moment, but people definitely will start working on this. Is her studies about early food introduction in the frequency of allergy rhinitis? I think it was addressed in some of the studies. I don't remember the, the data, but I don't think that there are any of the intervention uh, because allergic rhinitis is not something that occurs early, very early. So it's later in life and not so many studies are, uh, have this longer follow up. Uh, as far as I remember, there, are, there is no any intervention that would really reduce the risk of allergic rhinitis when it comes to, to nutritional intervention. Hi, 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 hi. Uh, also discuss role of hydrolyzed formula. Hydrolyzed formula, I presume there is a whole topic, different uh, uh, separate uh, discussion should be on the role of hydrolyzed formula in allergy prevention, but it's a good question. Until very recently, many recommendations um, were supporting the use of formulas with documented efficacy for uh, reducing the risk of allergic diseases. And um, however, this was recently questioned, mainly because of this BMJ meta-analysis and the Cochrane meta-analysis. This will be also addressed in the, um, in the uh, IACI guidelines. Uh, I think that we now all agree that when it comes to food allergy, there is no effect. I'm looking, discussing very specific outcome for or against. So it's difficult to formulate the recommendation because we cannot say neither that it reduces, not that it increases. For atopic eczema, yes, there are many studies that are showing that there is some reduction in the risk of atopic, uh, atopic eczema. So I think it's very important always to look which outcomes we are discussing. If we are discussing food allergy, that might be different uh, answer than when we are discussing, for example, eczema. Please wait for IACI for IACI recommendations we are addressing, but we are only addressing food allergy, not other outcomes. Thanks once again for being here today, tonight, today, tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Dr. Islam El Baroudi. I'm um, a consultant pediatrician in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City and uh, Cairo uh, University. Uh, Today and um, maybe during the time of uncertainty and during the hard time, we need to stand with each other. And I could assure you, all of you, that this time will pass. So hence talking about something like that. So we need to talk about the immune, the immunity, how to modulate, how to reduce the infection. And today, just will be talking about the background of this, of this immunity. Maybe all of you, I mean, they know that there's a problem for the parents in the first year of life. So a part of from talking about the financial one, the in-laws, the intimacy, the most 
I mean, appealing one is the fear of having baby in the first year of life. And why is that? All of them, they may think that it's me, Rook, it's marriage. But the problem that all of them, they will fear of having like a several medical advice. Why is that? Because maybe they are thinking of, of the end of that, which is maybe the death. Just keep in your mind that the cause of death in children below five years, it is mostly related to infection. So it is the diarrhea, the pneumonia, and even like the sepsis. So in the newborn, it is almost about 50% of the causes. In the children, those who are below five years, it is almost 60%. You can imagine. So talking about this period of time and how it is significant, because it is shaping the future of the child. It is that time that our children, they are continue their education. They could reach their potential IQ. And of course, it is said that they can earn more and more. But why? Why it is really significant at this period of time, the infancy and the early childhood, that's why we are talking, we are talking about. It is not only because of the 80% of our brain volume and development is happening during this time, but I could tell you something. During this time, if it is developed well, then you are able, 10 times, your kid is able 10 times to overcome a life-threatening childhood disease. And nowadays, we could recognize, we could understand the real importance of how to develop our babies or our kids during this early childhood or early infancy. So talking about that, it does mean that I'm talking about overcoming the life-threatening event or infection. It does mean that I'm talking about the immunity. Of course, it is not only the immunity that it is developing during the infancy and the childhood. You could see that it is the brain development, the general growth or whatever. But I could tell you that about 60% of our immunity is developed till the age of the three years and 80% by the age of five years. This could tell you how important the infancy and the childhood during the development of our immunity. So talking about infection, it is not only about having that we could guard against the infection like later on by having like an antibiotic. This is like a hospitalization. Why not to be a preemptive talking about the, the immunity? So that's why talking about infection, it does mean that I'm talking about the immunity. It is the other flip of the coin. They are the two flips of the same coin, infection and immunity. Please keep it in your mind. What's the immunity types? I think all of you that you could know that. So the immunity, it is the adaptive immunity, which is the natural one that you could get it passively from your mother, or even it is the actively one when you are getting our infection. Or the adaptive one, it is the artificial one passively. You could get the immunoglobulin, or what is nowadays that we are having a lot of talks about it. So you could have the serum plasma, even like from any recovered people, or the active immunization, this is the artificial adaptive immunity. But don't forget that you have your natural, your innate immunity, which is our anatomic barriers, which is the skin, the mucous membrane, that you should keep it moist, physiological barrier, the temperature, the pH, the phagocytic barriers, and the inflammatory response that we are having. The evolution of our immunity during the infancy, as we said, you are getting your immunity from your mother, it is the IgG, that you get it passively. But it is declining gradually. Simultaneously, our kid is developing their immunity. They are developing an IgG. In between that, there is a transient time or a transient gap of a low IgG. So while you are transferring from your maternal immunity to your own immunity, this gap is called the protection gap. Any evidence about the protection gap? Yes. So according to the study, so it could be seen that there is an increase in the number of the episodes of diarrhea during this area of this time, from six to 11 months. The otitis media, even those who needs an antibiotic. So it is between six to 11 months. So there is an evidence of this protection gap. On the cellular level, 
you could see that at birth, still all our immune cells, like the natural killer cells, the immunoglobulin G, the IgM, the IgA, the T helper one, even like our gut microbiota, still immature at the time of birth. Still it is taking time till the six months, one year, three years, four years, five years, till we could reach the green one, the mature, the mature one. Mostly your immune system, as we said, 80% of your immune system gonna be developed at the age of the five years, which is very important to keep in. What's the fundamentals of the immunity? How we could understand immunity? We need to know that the immune system or our like lymphocytes or lymphoid tissue that is responsible to produce the lymphocytes, usually it is associated with a mucosa. So wherever in our body there is a lymphoid tissue is associating our mucosa. It could happen in our respiratory tract. So maybe there is in our uh, bronchus and in our nasal and it is called like the palt or nalt. So this is a nasal associated lymphoid tissue. It is happening in the gastrointestinal tract. And surprisingly, you could know that 70 to 80% of our body lymphoid tissue that is responsible to produce our lymphocytes or our immunity is found in our GI. How this also could be differentiated, the nutrition, you could see that the, the nutrition and the microbiota or the bacteria that we are having in our GI by the intracellular microbial signals and extracellular microbial signals, it would affect what? The differentiation of what we are having that we call it the T naive cells. This is the, the T naive cells or the T zero cells. Differentiation into what? Into T helper one, maybe T helper two, T helper 17, and the T regulatory cells. Each of which is having its function. And this is would happen by a, a moderators. Like what? Like the interleukin 12, interleukin 4, interleukin 6, and interleukin 2. And just I need you to know something. That even not only by the, the effect of the nutrition and the microbiota, but also that there is a genetic predisposition. I could show you, you could see here, that there is a STAT4, we have a STAT6, STAT3, and a STAT5, and each of which as a gene is responsible in the differentiation of each cell. The T helper one, which is responsible for the cellular immunity, while the T helper two is the humoral immunity. And you need a balance between T helper one and T helper two. So you could have an immunity, not an allergy. So lymphoid tissue, bacteria and the nutrition affecting the differentiation. This is the main immune cells that we could have, but when, when to have it? It is in confrontation with a culprit. What is that culprit? It is the antigen, in case of that you are having an infection or an allergen, if you are talking about the inflammation or an allergy. So the normal ability to recognize a dangerous and a harmless, either antigen or allergen, then to act accordingly. But look at this, there's a condition. Preserving the integrity of our intestinal mucosa now, this is the tolerance for the defense. Tolerance, if you are talking about allergy or inflammation, and defense, if you are talking about the infection. And this is a key feature of our immunity. We should keep it. Any exaggeration, any exaggeration in this response or abnormal reaction, this is called an allergy or inflammation. We need to understand that there is a very fragile border between immunity and allergy and this is you as a healthcare professional just like not to have this fragile balance to have what to have a fitness of the immunity what does that mean to send it to the gym no fitness of the immunity it is called a resilient so to have to be a resilient immune system again what does that mean resilient immune system means that building in a capacity to adapt all the challenges of what? Establishing, maintaining, and regulating. Look at this appropriate immune response, because if it is not appropriate, if it is exaggerated, then that it is not an immune system, it is an, an allergy. So this is the, the fitness, or this is the immune fitness that you are as a healthcare professional is responsible to keep it like that, not 
to be a fragile one. And the analogy of the immune system fitness, it is similar to what? It is similar to the firewall. So to have an impressive picture of it, you need to have a right response at the right time in the right way. So this is what we are talking about. But how to ensure a fitness of our immune system? This is in your, in your hands. Just to tell you, immune development, as we said in early infancy, it is part of the whole development that it is happening in our, in our body, the brain development and the, and the metabolic development. 20% of that development is responsible by genetics. Look what I'm saying, just only 20%. So the remaining 80% is an environmental factor. And part of it, of course, is the, is the nutrition. So talking again about the nutrition, and its effect on the infant immaturity. Here we are talking about the malnutrition, either for the mother or even for the newborn or for the early childhood. And also we are talking about the microbiota, not to forget also the vaccination that playing a very important role in the development of our immunity. This is very important to, to, under, to understand. Just here to understand and to have the statement, infancy by default, has a higher risk to develop infection, inflammation, because of what? As we just said, because of the immature immune system and the still not fully developed the digestive system, which is really responsible or we could consider it as an immune organ. This is very important. So again, it is in your hand as a healthcare professional to, to boost this immune system during the infancy. So, just like to do that, we know that during this period of time that there is a rapid growth and the development, so it does mean that there is a specific nutritional requirement. And it is crucial for you as a healthcare professional to ensure that every mother and even the children have an access to what? To any nutrition? No, look at this, to optimal nutrition. You have to know that not all the nutrition are of the same. So you are the one who gonna choose the optimal nutrition. This is the start during the rapid growth, during the development. It is the start. And always remember, when there is a right start, there is a bright future. This is what we have to keep in our mind as a healthcare professional. This is really very important. So you are telling me as a health, you are a healthcare professional, you need to do something. It is in your hand. What is in my hand? You should tell me what is in my hand. Of course, our golden rule is the breastfeeding. Whenever someone, you should encourage the breastfeeding. Whenever someone is not in a breastfeeding, you, maybe you need to convince him, to convince him just like to return back to the breastfeeding. If not, then at that time, you have to choose an appropriate formula and of course, the complementary feeding and to build up a healthy nutritional habits, practices, and look at this, to safeguard against deficiencies and infection. The base is the breastfeeding and the complementary and the appropriate formula if it is not, if you are not having the breastfeeding. For what? To have the proper immunity. This is very important to be understood. And talking about the breastfeeding, having a proper immunity, why you are saying or talking about something like that? Because when we are talking about the breastfeeding or the breast milk, it is said that those who are breastfed, they are less vulnerable to have a risk by 42%. Why? Why we are saying something like that about the breastfeeding? Look at this. This is the constituents of our breast milk. This is the components of our breast milk. And all of them, they are working together in an orchestrated manner, which is very important to know. Our breast milk is affecting the whole aspect of our health. It is affecting the immunity, the growth, the gut health, and whatever. Talking today about the immunity, what specifically may affect our immunity? It's the macronutrients like the proteins and the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid, the LC provers, and of course the human milk oligosaccharides and the bacteria. Always remember, our breast milk is not sterile. Still, it is having the beneficial bacteria. So talking about the macronutrients and about the, the LC provers, so this is the evidence 
for the omega-3 and omega-6, and omega-6, the DHA and the ARA. So the conclusion from that, the impact of the lc for the for the early nutrition on the allergic manifestation, DHA and ARA supplementation, which is started in every formula, I think, by the, by the year of 2001, it was associated with a delayed onset and reduced incidence of upper respiratory tract infection and even a common allergic disease up to three years of age. What else other than that in the breast milk? We have talking about the human milk oligosaccharide, the prebiotics. This is something unique to our breast milk. You could see that cow's milk is lacking this human milk oligosaccharides. Maybe it is just only 0.1% and just to show you if we are having like a tracer or a marker. So this is the, the difference. So how much we are having an HMO prebiotics in our breast milk and how much in the cow's milk. And this is the difference. This is a big difference that we should understand. What is the human milk oligosaccharide that we are having? What is the structure? So we have a main structure or the main stone, which is the, the lactose, which is consistent of glucose and galactose, which could be elongated by like N-acetylglucosamine or could be fucosylated or salylated. To have what? To have either a short chains or a long chains of our human milk oligosaccharide. So we will have either like a short chain or a long chain uh, human milk oligosaccharides. We have more than 250 different structure of a human milk oligosaccharide in our breast milk. The most studies and even the most abundant one in our human milk, more than 30% of the total human milk oligosaccharide structure is the 2FL and the LNMT. So these are the most studied structure of the HMOs. So we are talking about the factors that are affecting the immunity. It is the nutrition, as we just said. So it's the macronutrients and of course the, the microbiota. What is bridging the nutrition and the microbiota? It is, as we just said, we're just talking about, it is the, the human milk oligosaccharide, something from the nutrition affecting our microbiota. What is microbiota? So microbiota, and I know all of you may be like having a background about it. It's a community of several organisms. Maybe it is bacterial, maybe viral, maybe fungal. Not only in our GI, it could be found everywhere, everywhere in your skin. But to be honest, 95% of our bacterial microbiota is found in our GI. What about the size? It is 10 to 50 times smaller than our cells. But look at this. For each human cell, we have a 10 microbial cell. This is something just like we have to think about it. And we have a good news today for those who are concerned about their weight. If you are concerned about this, your weight today, so the good news is that you could deduct two kilograms from your weight because this is the weight of the microbiota that you are carrying with you everywhere that you are going. So this is the weight and we have more than 100 trillion organism or a microbiota organism. That's why Alana Colin has said that we are just only a 10% human. The remaining, the 90% of our composition is a microbiota. So maybe they are the basic they are the basic and we are the parasite. Having or talking about the microbiota or the bacteria, so we have a good bacteria and this is what we call it the symbionts. Like what? Like the bifidobacteria or the lactobacilli. And we have a bad bacteria like the Campylobacter or like the Cholesteridium difficile and this is called the bathobiome. This is the diversity to have a good and a bad bacteria in a several sites. If you have a good bacteria more than a bad bacteria, this is what we call it a symbiosis. If the bad bacteria is more than the good bacteria, this is what we call it a dysbiosis. What is your aim from this diversity? Your aim is to have a symbiosis, to have a more good bacteria. This is what you are aiming for. Why I'm talking about that? Because rich or balanced bacteria or symbiosis, it equals normal immune system. It equals proper differentiation of our lymphoid tissue. While the poor or unbalanced bacteria, it would have a bad and an ugly scenario. The bad scenario that you may develop a lot of inflammatory or allergic disease like celiac disease, 
inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, obesity, type 2 diabetes. So this is a bad scenario. Still, we are not talking about the ugly one. The ugly one is to having a leaky gut syndrome. What's that leaky gut syndrome? So you will end up having an autoimmune disease. It is related to an over or exaggerating immune response, like the multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the systemic lupus, the rheumatoid arthritis, our immunity in early life. This is very important to, to understand. Is there an evidence regarding the microbiota and the immunity? Yes. So this is published in the National Institute of Health. And they said, or stating that microbiota has an intrinsic regulator of all immune responses. This is very important. So talking about the microbiota, and that if we could handle our microbiota, then we will have the symbiosis. You will be safe of not developing this bad or ugly scenario. So what is in your hand to do other than the food? We said, okay, that the breastfeeding is the base. But if you're going to choose something for formula or during the weaning food, is it the prebiotics? Is it the probiotic? Is it the fecal transplantation that could affect our gut microbiota? Is it the antimicrobial or all of the above? Yes, all of them, all of them could affect our gut microbiota and could reach us as symbiosis. But this is in a specific, by a specific manner and we have to study some of them. Today, we are talking about the prebiotics, multiple definition. Then we are reaching to 2017. This is the revised definition. So it is a substrate that it is selective. Look at this selectively utilized by host microorganism. So it is a food for a specific microorganism, a specific microorganism. But the condition is that it's supposed to confer a health benefit. If it is not providing a health benefit to the host, then it is not a prebiotics. So this is very important. And they said it is not only just a carbohydrate, even more than that could be considered as a prebiotics. The concept of the prebiotics, just to understand it, that you could, that it should survive the acidic condition of our stomach, then evade the digestion from the small intestine, then selectively to be fermented in our colon to stimulate a limited number or the beneficial bacteria, such as the bifidobacterium or the lactobacilli. So this is the, the concept. What is the aim of the fermentation? It is converting the food from the indigestible form to be a digestible form, and maybe it could remove the toxic uh, material that it may, be, it may be there. So just like to avoid any confusion between prebiotic and the probiotic, just remember that pre by E shouldn't be eaten unless in colon. This is the concept of the, of the prebiotic. This is the summary of the whole story of the prebiotics. What's the commonly used the prebiotic? These are the commonly used the prebiotic. But the most studied one is the Goss and Foss mixture. It is more than 30 studies about the Goss and Foss, more than 55 publications. There is a positive effect on our infant microbiota, as we said, how to handle the microbiota. And not only on the microbiota, but also there is a positive effect on the clinical health outcome. And there is an evidence base about this effect. What is the GOS FOS prebiotics? So the GOS FOS prebiotics, so we have the GOS one, which is the galacto oligosaccharides. And this is from a natural origin. This is the short chain. And we have the fracto oligosaccharide, and this is from a plant origin, to make the long chain. If you could remember that in our human milk oligosaccharide that we are having a short chain and we are having a long chain. So we are having a short chain and a long chain in a ratio of a nine to one. A ratio of a nine to one. Is that remind you something? If you remember the human milk oligosaccharide as we just were talking or we just mentioning, so it was like, a long chains and a shorter chains and a different types of structure. Is it equal to the infant nutrition with this GOS and FOS structure or mixture? From the prebiotic point of view, yes, it is. 
So the infant nutrition with Gosson Foss is almost the same as the human milk prebiotics. Do we have an evidence for that? Yes. We know that the human milk oligosaccharide in our human milk has an effect on the microbiota. So it is increasing the, the number or the diversity or the symbiosis of what? Of the bifidobacteria and the, lactobac and the lactobacilli. This is what we call it the bifidogenic effect. So we have a study to show is that prebiotic or whatever the prebiotic is having the same effect similar to the human milk oligosaccharide or not. So we have the breastfeeding group, then we have a two group, the controlled one, which is not having the Gosson Foss, so having like a formula without Gosson Foss, and the other one which is having the Gosson Foss. Then we are getting the fecal sample with a three day interval. So then at, at that time, we're having at day zero, then four weeks, then end of a six weeks. So what was the result? The result that the colon microbiota in infants fed with Gosson Foss, having like more likely breastfed infant, the same significantly, the same signature, the same diversity with a higher percentage of the bifidogenic bacteria. And they said that that effect, it was a dose related. What does that mean? So in the same study, they were giving like, even like the, the two groups, some were getting like a 0.4 and the other were getting an oh, a 0.8 gram per deciliter. Those who received a 0.8 gram per deciliter of Gauss and Foss were having a higher bifidogenic effect. What else? Of course, the human milk oligosaccharide has the effect in our colon to have the shorter chain, the production of a shorter chain fatty acid which is this short chain fatty acids. It is the acetate, the propionate, and the butyrate. They said that the effect of the infant formula containing a mixture of that uh, having a viable bifidobacterium, to have a viable bifidobacterium, the same as a bifidobacterium, they said that Gauss and Foss infant formula indu in induced the same pattern of the short chain fatty acid induced by the breastfed infant. And look at this, it is the acetate, the propionate, and the, the butyrate. So this is what we are having by the, the prebiotic gosanfos. You may tell me, does that make a difference? The short chain fatty acid, look at this. This is the effect of the short chain fatty acid. Apart from the nutrition and metabolism and the gut brain connection, we are talking today about the immunity. So protection and immunity, it is doing a signaling and a precursor, a precursor role in the interaction of the immune cells. Having a direct action for the absorption of the water and electrolytes, and this is minimizing the diarrhea, infection. Increasing the colonic blood flow and enhances the ileal motility. And again, the acetate propionate ratio, this is an acidic medium, which is not favorable for any pathogenic growth. This is very important to could understand that Gauss and Foss as a prebiotic, having from the prebiotic point of view, have a similar effect as the human milk oligo, oligosaccharide. On the cellular level, what does Gauss and Foss is doing to our immunity? So having a selective fermentation of our Gauss and Foss it is affecting our T helper one and T regulatory cells. So it is balancing with the T helper two. This would reduce the allergy. Of course, this is through uh, a modulator, which is the interleukin uh, 10. The other factor that producing an antimicrobial agent, this antimicrobial agent, of course, by the bifidogenic effect, it would lead to what? to increasing the phagocytic activity, the natural killer cell activity. Do you remember that these are the innate immunity? Now you are handling your immune, you are handling your immune, you are handling your immune uh, system. And this is, would increase your defense against the, the pathogens. The second thing, it is competing for the nutrition with the, it is competing with the nutrition with whom? with those who are a nutrition for the bad bacteria. The other thing is, it is producing the short chain fatty acid, the acetate, butyrate, and the propionate. 
and this is reducing the pH, having an acidic, acidic medium, decreasing the infection. All of that we are talking about the infection. What about the allergy? Yes, it is inducing a proper immunity because it is improving the zonulin, which is could be found in our tight junction. And this is could help like in reducing the incidence to have a celiac disease. So talking about the prebiotic now, so it was like on the cellular level. What about the clinical evidence? In this study, it is showing that gosanthos is reducing the bacterial infection that could be found in our intestine after six weeks of intaking this gosanthos prebiotic, the E. coli, the colistridium, the fissile. Not only that, in another study, it is showing by stool analysis that gosanthos is increasing or stimulating the secretory immunoglobulin A. Usually immunoglobulin A is found in our mucosal membrane. It could be found in the mucosa. So it is increasing the immunoglobulin by the week of 26. This is also increasing our immunity and decreasing the incidence to have an infection. In this study, which is a 12 month open study by bruises, so we are talking about what? We are having a two groups. Some of them is not getting the gosanthos, the other are getting the gosanthos. What is the result? The severity regarding the gastrointestinal, uh, the gastroenteritis or the diarrhea, the severity, the acute diarrhea is less. And the other thing that the number of the episodes of diarrhea, again, it is less for those who are receiving gosanthos. In the same study, they are talking about the upper respiratory tract infection, which is if it is more than three times, it is less. So less than more three times to have an upper respiratory tract infection during the first year and the need for the courses of antibiotic. So in the same study, we are talking about decreasing the severity of the gastroenteritis. We are talking about decreasing the frequency of the gastroenteritis, talking about less upper respiratory tract infection times and the need for the antibiotic. In Arsan Aglo, also in 2007, also he was studying a six month double blind randomized placebo controlled parallel study, uh, uh, study with a 259 healthy infants. And they were taking the result along six months, at two months, four months, and six months. What was the result? Statistical significance in reducing any infection in general was there, decreasing the frequency of a recurrent infection and the recurrent upper respiratory tract infection. So this is in the first six months. Then they did a follow-up at the age of 18 months to see how frequent or how is the severity of the infection. The significance was at the age of 18 months. So it is a long lasting effect for this goes and false regarding the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract infection for the UTI and for the antibiotic needs for the infection, maybe it is ameliorating the effect like in the viral infection and even like in the parents diagnosed fever, those who are coming or burdening your clinic with a fever. Another study also, it is talking about the upper respiratory tract infection and the GI. So it is a two month parallel study for a 250 healthy infant having gosanthos by eight gram per day versus a control and a breast, breast infant. What's the result? Look at this. So for those who are receiving the, the prebiotic formula, this is the upper respiratory tract infection is less and the GI infection again is less, which is uh, uh, statistically significant. Gosanthos also was studied in the growing up milk, supplemented with these prebiotic plus an LC puvis to see the effect on the infection for these young children. So they are 767 healthy infants fed with gosanthos and LC puvis versus a normal control without these things. For how long? For 52 weeks. So this is a randomized double blind controlled parallel multi country interventional study. Why I'm saying that? Because there was a significant decrease 
in the confirmed infection for those who are receiving the prebiotics and the LC bova. But when, when they are prolonging the study over these, I mean, uh, over a long period of time, and hence we could say that there is no gained result unless a sustainability. You need to sustain whatever that you are choosing for a nutrition so you could have the result. This is very important to keep it in your, in your mind. So this was the conclusion that the use of formula supplemented with Gauss and Foss and LC Puvas reduces the risk of infection for those children attending in the daycare centers. The prebiotics having also an extra mice. What does that mean? We were talking about that the prebiotics is affecting our microbiota. This is the bifidogenic effect. It is increasing our immunity, either directly or indirectly. We were talking about that even on the cellular level. They are decreasing the allergy. They are increasing our short chain fatty acid production. And we have seen what is the effect of the short chain fatty acid. But not only that. Whenever that you are giving this prebiotic, you are tackling the immunity. You are boosting this immunity. You will get an extra effect. So as if that it is buy one and get the other free, you will get a GI tolerance, a metabolic effect for the blood glucose and monitoring or and the blood pressure for the growth, increasing the growth and decreasing the weight. So this is an extra mile also going to be happening with a prebiotic, with a prebiotic function. And talking about the immunity, we could never ignore the situation that we are in and as if that we are saying that this is the talk of the town according to to uh, zishner and he's the, the co-author of what we call it a commentary uh, article this is the commentary article this is about the the pediatric involvement in the covid 19 and he noted that the worst outcome were in the children if you are categorizing them as an age group was among the infants. And in that study, it showed that 30% of a child with a COVID-19 cases deemed severe. More than 50% deemed critical. All of these 30 and 50%, most of them were less than one year. Of course, the weak point of the study that we are having a limited number, but we know that still that this is a new, a new situation that we are studying. So what's the morale that we could know that younger children facing a higher likelihood of more dangerous outcome, depending on what? Look at this, the age group and the efficiency of the immune system. Again, it is in your hand. So increasing the efficiency of the immune system, it is something in our hand as a healthcare professional. We shouldn't ignore it. This is really matter. Really, it is matter. And just before the end, we have two conclusions and two messages. So the first conclusion that every time that you need to have a healthy outside, it should start from your inside. If you have a proper immunity, you will have a healthy kid. So please take care of the kid's immunity. This is very important. The second conclusion, as a healthcare professional, in our hand is a nutrition. Nutrition, it does mean, as we have said, it is the nutrition, it is the microbiota, and it could affect our immune function. It could elevate our immune function. It could transfer our immune function from susceptible to infection to resistant to infection, to, to avoid having an allergy. This is what we call it the immunity fitness when we started. It is in your hand not to have a fragile border between the immunity and between the infection. It is in your, in your hand. How you are doing that? The nutrition, it is Gosan Foss prebiotics, and of course, a symbiosis by whatever, by whatever uh, possible that, uh, uh, weapon that you could have in your, in your hand. And my message, it is easier to build strong children, which is in our hand now, than to repair a broken man. And the second message, as everyone is saying, stay safe and stay home.
थैंक यू Yes. So when when we are supposed to give formula milk, some formula milks claim to have human milk, oligosaccharide, and some formula milk claiming of okay. other important nutrients. Then we should switch to the other oh. formula milk so, every six months. First of all, yeah. So f first of all, I mean, we need, I mean, to emphasize that uh, uh, breast milk. I mean, this is the gold standard. This is what we should encourage. But in some certain uh, situation. that we are unable to continue with, with the breast milk, either this is something like a clinical issue, a medical issue, or even like the, the parents, they are refusing. Then at that time, it is the rule for the healthcare professional to choose a proper, a proper formula. So the proper formula is whatever, is just trying to, to bridge the gaps between the formula and the breast milk or trying to mimic the breast milk even in its structure or in its function, then this is supposed the one to be to be chosen. And today we were like uh, just uh, explaining. So whatever like the ingredients in our breast milk, whatever the ingredient is having like a great impact. So you should keep in your mind whatever ingredient is having whatever impact and then you can choose that. Excellent. And the next question, can normal microbiota cause disease? Normal? Normal microbiota. Can normal no, microbiota cause disease? No, I mean, uh, the, the normal, normal microbiota, this is the aim. This is what we are looking for. So if you have like, if you are fulfilling a criteria for someone who's having like a normal vaginal delivery and that he is developing or growing without like any antibiotic, without any any infection having a proper uh, having a breast milk then he is developing the proper microbiota or what we call it the symbiosis and then at that time he is he is deviated from having something or having like uh, any uh, disease or any infection this is this is very important to understand even for those who are having a dysbiosis we are trying to to amend it to be symbiotic not a dysbiotic fantastic and i think the time for one Final question, just bear with me one moment. Um, ah, here we go. Um, is there a good relation between increased immunity and defiance of COVID-19? Increased immunity? Yes, is there a relation, is there a, rela is I mean, there I mean, a good relationship let us, between I mean, let, us, let, let us put it in the proper way. So, I mean, you need your, uh, your proper immunity or to boost your immunity or to have a proper immunity in general so you are guarding against you against whatever infection COVID-19 is one of them but we couldn't say specifically that boosting the immunity at that time would I mean would uh, prevent you from having a COVID-19 there is it is a multifactorial but in general of course boosting your immunity you will be more prepared to I mean to uh, to guard against any infection including the COVID-19 Okay, thank you for that. And I think the, the final question, which is, can we add prebiotics for babies who suffer from immune deficiency? For the, for the immune deficiency, I mean, this is, I mean, this is very important. Okay, so if you know, I mean, that this prebiotic is uh, really uh, could go to the good bacteria, and this is would boost your immunity, then at that time, you could do that. In general, sometimes that we are refraining from adding a prebiotic for those who are immune deficient, unless that we are making sure that maybe that this is specific prebiotic, so that there is a specific action for each prebiotic, then at that time you could take your decision. 